lecture, I just want to introduce a couple of concepts that we will be looking at throughout the semester in terms of how we understand the challenges that face world regions today. And what I want to focus on briefly are three terms that were introduced in this chapter of your readings, the idea of wealth, of poverty, and then the concept of globalization and its counterpart, neocolonialism. So one of the things that I want to look at, uh, and I find this to be a very, very interesting uh, map or graphic, is the idea first of wealth. If we look at the world and we look at where the richest of the rich are, a couple of things come out very, very pointedly. First of all, by far, the net worth of the richest resides in the United States. The Americas overall by far have the largest amount of money, um, almost two and a half trillion dollars held by individuals. In the United States alone, we have over $1.8 trillion in the hands of billionaires. It's kind of a crazy idea. Now, we also have 571 billionaires. That's an immense number of people that have over a billion dollars. But what I want to focus on here is the inequity of it. Notice how many of those billionaires are in the United States. And then if we take Europe together, we have the vast majority of the world's wealth. Compare that to what's in the Middle East and in Africa. A very, very small portion, less than $300 billion. Now, I know that sounds like an immense amount of money, but really when you compare that, that's, that's a sixth of what's in the United States alone when you think about the wealth in the Middle East and Africa. We often think about the oil rich, but it's a very, very small amount of wealth. So wealth, the world's wealth, is absolutely concentrated in the United States. And that's always been, and I shouldn't say always, but in the last half century, it's been a really important issue because the United States wealth, those people and that wealth control much of what is going on in the world. When we think about globalization and especially neocolonialism, the power that is held in that money is significant. Now, another, again, the other way of seeing this, I just want to real quickly, this is kind of in 2018, things are beginning to change a little bit. You'll notice that what's now happening is that Europe's importance is going down a little bit in the last five years, and Asia's influence is going up. Now, again, Asia at 1.1 trillion, the United States now is well over a trillion dollars in terms of its billionaire wealth. It's an amazing amount of money, and again, an amazing amount of power. Now, unfortunately, I want to flip that around. This is the population in the world living on less than $2 a day. And again, for the exam, that $2 a day is kind of the universal measure of poverty. Okay? It doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you make less than $2 a day, if you live on less than $2 a day, you are in what we consider extreme poverty. What I want to point out with that is that when we look here, essentially Anglo-America, really North America, we have less than 5% of the population across an entire region living on less than $2 a day. Now, it is important to note, and this is one of the more disturbing aspects of this, that there are people in the United States that live that way. Not many. But it does happen, and that's a, a rather disconcerting idea. But what you'll notice is, by and large, in the Americas, that number is very, very low. That number is also very low throughout Europe. Notice, though, the divide that's happened here. China has dramatically, since the 1950s, pulled itself out of poverty. India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Southeast Asia, especially um, when we look in into the the countries that did not develop in the Asian tigers, and we'll get to that later on, you see a very distinct divide in Asia, and you see a dramatic divide in terms of the African continent. Now also, please note, the country's gray here, we simply don't have data for. And so, but what I want you to think about is, 
that immense wealth, the billions of dollars and billions or, and hundreds of billionaires in the United States, and then the extreme poverty that we see in the rest of the world. Now, that gets us to this idea of globalization. Globalization is often used as a positive term, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. Globalization is the increased global interconnectedness of economic, political, and social activities. Much of the wealth in the United States has been built on that globalization. We think about Amazon and, um, and Bezos or um, Apple, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Globalization is part of this. The social networking, the economics of information have essentially allowed globalization to occur. And remember, globalization means that we spread out manufacturing information technology in order to increase profits. It's a very much a profit-driven strategy. Now, there are good parts that come along with it. Because of it, communications have improved. Opportunities for education have improved. But the downside of globalization, or at least the potential negative side, is what we call neocolonialism. Now, that increased interconnectedness does mean that the people that control the economic activities have much, much greater power. Neocolonialism is, in a sense, the, the change from a colonial power, which did it militarily, to a neocolonial power which does it economically. The dominance of other countries through economic and political pressures. That's neocolonialism. Now we can see these pressures and we can see globalization through a couple of very quick uh, graphics here. What you'll notice here, these are the airports. These are kind of the world airports. And what you'll notice is kind of where the hubs are. Here is Europe and how many hubs of air travel there are. Here's North America, here's Asia. Now what you'll notice very quickly is how small the concentration, and again, size of the dot influences or uh, indicates their influence. Look at how small the dots are and how few connections are in Latin America, in Africa, and in much of Southeast Asia. Look at how powerful and how strong the connections are in Asia, East Asia particularly, Europe and North America. Again, it's a radically uneven connection, but the connections are immense. We can also see it in the global internet map. Again, the thickness of the lines indicates the level of connectivity and the flow of data. Very quickly, you see that the European, US connections are very, very strong as are the U.S. to East Asia connections. But you'll also notice that all of the regions are connected. Internet, the Internet and its connectivity has made the world a very, very small place. But, again, the circles indicate how much flow. Look at how small Africa's circle is, how little connection they have to the rest of the world. The African continent is, in some respects, being left behind, at least in terms of the, the high tech and the communications that are part of globalization. And that's also an implication for neocolonialism. Now, the other way we can look at this, and this is just kind of an odd uh, data set, but General Motors has 152 facilities that they claim they're very proud of this, are landfill free. That is that they don't put anything into landfills. Now, that's an interesting side note, but what I find fascinating about this map is the distribution of their facilities. General Motors, you know, and arguably an American automobile company, has manufacturing components all over the world. And in fact, if you look at it, they actually have more facilities when you take the rest of the world combined than they have in the United States, significantly more. And so, again, companies are no longer U.S. companies. Even something as, as American as General Motors is really a global company, and globalization makes this possible. Okay, that's it for Lecture 6. We have one more lecture left on culture, and that will be it for Module 2.